In the fourth chapter of Amos, God is speaking to his chosen people who are now apostate and have been out of his will for a long, long time. And he says in verse 6, I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places, yet have you not returned unto me? And in verse 7, And also I have withholden the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest and I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased. The palmer worm devoured them. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Yet have ye not returned unto me. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Wherefore thus will I do unto you, O Israel, and because I do this unto you, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Of all the things that they endured, they didn't return to the Lord. And so now, they're being told, you're going to meet him. He's going to continue doing this. And you have your choice. You may meet him as your adversary and contend with him. Or you can be penitent and humble and come to him and seek his mercy. We follow through in chapter 5. And I just draw your attention to a few passages in chapter 5. Verse 4, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Seek me, and ye shall live. Verse 6, Seek the Lord, and ye shall live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Jacob. In verse 8, Seek him that maketh the seven stars, that's the Pleiades, and Orion, and turneth the shade, the shadow of death, into morning and maketh the day dark with night that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. And in verse 14 he says, Seek good and not evil that ye may live. Do you see the connection? It's a still an invitation, isn't it? There is still the invitation. There is the stick, but there is also the carrot. No question about it. And you know the first thing we want to bear in mind when we're reading the word of God is that it's revealing more and more about himself. Sometimes confirming what we've already learned in prior study. Other times showing us more of himself that we hadn't seen before. Who is it that is speaking? This great God. Notice the last verse of chapter 4 after he has said, Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Who is he? For lo, he that formeth the mountains, and createth the wind, and declareth unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Israel, Israel. Your God is calling you. Prepare to meet thy God. Remember, he's thy God. You know, it's interesting to bear in mind that the Lord allowed these plagues and pestilences to come upon them periodically, drought, uh, crop failure, all these other things. And yet, 
they did not move toward God at all. They persisted in their evil way. But remember now that we're dealing with a nation. This nation is away from God. It's an apostate nation. And yet, God had put his love upon them. God had chosen them. And their fathers had made an agreement with God. Way back, they made an agreement, as they said, for us and for our children, thou art our God, and we will serve thee. And they entered into the promise that they would be obedient. I wish that we could just take everybody and, 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 and just saturate them uh, with more of the Old Testament so that when they come into the New Testament they will understand it so much better. I'm going to ask you to go, go with me to Deuteronomy for a moment. The fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy. <clears throat> and in chapter 28, for example... And it shall come to pass, this is chapter 28, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I commanded thee this day, that the Lord thy God, remember there's that personal uh, word, thy, a possessive pronoun, thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. You'll be the envy of all the other nations. And this is what he had said when he took them right out of Egypt. Verse 2. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Now notice what they are. Blessed shalt thou be in the city and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of of thy cattle, the increase of thy kine, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be the basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in. Blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee <clears throat> in thy storehouses <clears throat> and in all that thou settest thine hand unto and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself as he hath sworn unto thee if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways and all people of the earth shall see that thou art called <clears throat> by the name of the Lord. And they shall be afraid of thee. What prom promises, huh? Isn't that great? But then he goes on later on in this chapter in 29 and 30 to list these things and say there's going to be a curse on every one of those things. Instead of a blessing, there will be a curse. You have a choice. Now the Lord <coughs> chastens his own. He chastens his own by taking from them those things that would be rightfully theirs. But because of their disobedience, they have to suffer. We touched upon a problem in our last session, <coughs> and I want to... Uh, Explore it a little bit more now. Many people have misunderstood <clears throat> the lesson in the Word of God about chastening, the Lord's disciplining people. And so often when people have had difficulties, they've had the feeling that God was punishing them. Christians have, have been in agony of heart because they thought well God must be punishing me for something to allow this or that to happen they have not understood sometimes he allows us to go through testings and, and, and trials and that is to bring out our, our faith cause us to depend more upon him 
But affliction does not mean that God is punishing us. No, but the discipline to which we refer has to do with our spiritual blessings in Christ. I want to make this very as clear as I know how, because I know people are confused in this. And uh, I, have, I have felt many times that it was just a waste of time, a waste of time to try to correct folks who did not understand the epistles of Paul. Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, I just felt there was a waste of time because their opinions or their arguments or their views or the concepts they had revealed that they were totally ignorant of the Old Testament, not knowing God, not knowing his purposes, and not learning to just take the word of God literally, read it, and allow it to say what it says and don't try to read something uh, into it. There is no substitute for reading and reading and reading. And if we become acquainted with the God of the Bible and his purposes and what, he, and, and what his attitude is toward his chosen, and we begin to see that there are different kinds of love and that there is a general favor of God has toward humanity instead of dis, uh, discarding the whole bunch He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But that's not all that is to be said about God. God has a special love for his people. When he called Israel out of Egypt, he was talking to them one day through Moses, and this is what he said. I have taken you out of Egypt that I might bring you in to the land of promise. I've taken you out that I might bring you in. He revealed to them that he had a purpose. It wasn't just to get them out of Egypt, but to bring them to the place of his own choosing that he'd promised to Abraham centuries before that. But then he wanted them to know that he had a special concern for them because he had called them And they had responded and ratified the agreement through their elders. And he says this, and I love this. I have loved you because I have loved you. Almost as if the Almighty could not find any logical reason whatever for loving an unlovely people or choosing a stiff-necked, hard-hearted, stubborn people. I have loved you because I just loved you. You see, love is not just a matter of emotion or feeling, is it? No, no. True love, in the biblical sense, is the product of the mind, the product of intellect, and the product of will purpose, volition, the purpose of the will. And thus in, uh, involving uh, emotion. <clears throat> and because they had ratified the agreement that he was going to be their God and they were worshiping no other gods, they would get earthly blessings, health, no sickness, prosperity, abundant crops, <clears throat> Their children would be well. They would have increase in their cattle and the sheep and all the rest of it, all material, earthly, temporal advantages called blessings. That was for them because they were God's people, not because they deserved it, but because he had made a choice. They had ratified that. And God is not going to give up on his part of the bargain. He warned them that disobedience would bring disaster after disaster. But he wasn't going to give up on his promise. And one of the things that oh, just fascinates me is that God is one day going to get Israel back to the land in obedience to himself. He will. And he'll work through them through circumstances and so forth, but we haven't time to go into that now. 
But oh, what they lost. Oh, what they forfeited. And we just read a little bit again. We repeated what we had before, didn't we? The plague, <clears throat> the pestilence, <clears throat> the palm of worm, the withholding of rain, young men being killed, and all of this. Disasters. And they didn't return to the Lord. These were all forms of discipline, chastening from the Lord. Now that helps us to understand what we have in the book of uh, the epistle to the Hebrews in the New Testament. And I'd like to read a bit of that. It's so important that we understand this. Now he's not talking to the world. He's not talking to the unsaved. He's not talking to those without profession. Verse 5 of Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, chapter 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. And he quotes from Proverbs. My son, despise not thou the chastening or the discipline of the Lord. That's what the word really means. nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. They're his people. They were in the Old Testament, that's the Jews. Now in the New Testament, it's the Christians. And he's writing to people of Jewish background who would appreciate their own history. For whom the Lord loveth, he disciplines and scourges every son whom he receiveth. Now, if ye endure this chastening or discipline, God is dealing with you as with sons, not as enemies to be punished, but as sons. For what son is he whom the Father does not discipline or chasteneth not? But if ye be without discipline, whereof all are partakers. There's all believers will have to end meet the Lord's discipline. Then are ye illegitimate and not as sons. Now here is a warning to us. He says that all are partakers of, of God's discipline. And it's those that he has called. And just as he once called Israel as a nation and had to deal with them and allowed these things to come upon them so that he could say to them, prepare to meet thy God. <clears throat> come unto me. Seek the Lord. So he's dealing with Christians today, the born again people, the saved individuals. If they become disobedient, they're going to lose something. But it's not earthly blessings, but it's heavenly. For we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And those are the things primarily that God causes us not to fully appropriate when we are disobedient. Therefore, there are people who call themselves Christians and are far from God. They're out of fellowship with him, but they call themselves Christians. And not even saved but they prosper things are going just well and the human mind is such that it assumes that well if things are going fine then God must be satisfied with me period that's it that's all the human mind can think of but as we saw in our earlier session how about love and joy and peace and long suffering gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, and so forth. Those are the things that the unsaved know nothing about. They don't have it, so it can't be taken from them. But that's the area particularly in which God works, to discipline us. He may, or, uh, he may take away other things. Well, he can do that, to teach us lessons, to test our faith and so forth. But the chief area, and this is analogous to what you have in the Old Testament, 
to Israel, it was prosperity and health and well-being and good crops and plenty of rain in due season and good business and, and so forth. Those were material, earthly blessings. But for us, our blessings are heavenly. They're spiritual. They're of such a nature that we can have them whether we're rich or we're poor. We can have them whether we're well or ailing. We can have them whether we're together with others or we have to be alone. Oh, if people only understood that. Then when the material things are not what they would like, they are not to assume that, well, God must be punishing me for some reason. No, no. You know, when he disciplines us, he deals primarily with the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Something is missing. Joy. It just isn't there. Why isn't it? Do you remember the time when probably you came to a service, you'd been disobedient, you hadn't been walking close to the Lord, you came to a service and we were announcing one song after another that seemed to have to do with joy. And you felt just miserable on the inside. And you were saying to yourself, I don't have it. You felt like praying like the psalmist of old, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Peace, gentleness, goodness, temperance, self-control. You find that the old nature has begun to take over because the Holy Spirit is grieved, don't you see? The Holy Spirit is grieved. And so where he would be producing uh, meekness and temperance and self-control and these uh, virtues that are the fruit of the Holy Spirit, your life becomes more and more like the worldling or the unsaved person. Outwardly, you may prosper. You may be in good health and you may have a new suit or clothes and, and have a better job and somebody else did the snow plowing for you. All kinds of things may have... Oh, you say, they just fell into place. But you're miserable on the inside because you once knew the joy of the Lord you once knew the peace of God that passeth all understanding <clears throat> you once knew what it was to have someone control your temper and your irritability and, and somehow that isn't happening uh, now and instead of long suffering or being slow to anger you're given to petulance and, and so forth you're really miserable on the inside now whom the Lord loves he chasteneth do you see it? and he doesn't give up he doesn't give up what a wonderful God we have I wish you'd take the time to read in Deuteronomy those chapters 28, 29, and 30 and see what God promised this people. And then he let them know that they would become the envy of all the other nations. As he was to say later on to them in, in Isaiah. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. They're going to see you. They're going to observe this. But oh, that people, stubborn, stiff-necked, hard-hearted, and they turned to other gods and they really copied the nations instead of copying of the Lord. And so these things came upon them and in increasing amount until finally God had to, as he said, remove you out of my sight. Now that meant that he had chosen uh, the particular area, we call it Palestine today, the land of Canaan. He had chosen that his favor was there. And he said, I'm going to get you right out of this. And you're going to be scattered way back. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses tells them that because of disobedience, they're going to be scattered and scattered among the nations. And they're going to cry out in the night, oh, if it were only morning. 
And in the morning, in the daytime, they'd be crying, oh, if only night could come. Failure of eyesight. All of these things. I don't know if you've read uh, some of the uh, <clears throat> more uh, current history or the ancient history of the Jewish people uh, in, in all of these, uh, the last, uh, these last centuries, how they've been scattered to every nation and how they've been hunted and how they've been persecuted and so often in fear of their lives all the time. God said way back in the days of Moses, he said that's just what's going to happen. You can have my blessings or you can have the curses. But I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. He said, someday, someday, you're going to call upon me. Someday, you're going to come back. And then I'll restore you to your land. Now, you know that there is a nation of Israel today. But that's not, that's not the fulfillment of prophecy. No, no, that is yet to come. They have tried to take this land by themselves and they're in all kinds of trouble and I don't think there's a human being alive that can solve the, the riddle of the Middle East. It's a tremendous, tremendous problem there. But the Lord Jesus Christ is going to handle it when he comes. But they're going to have to call upon him. And there you get right back to the same basic invitation. You had it in the choir tonight. The words of Jesus himself. And here you have it in, uh, in Amos. Seek me. See, prepare to meet thy God. You don't want to have this continue, this loss of prosperity and loss of health and the invaders coming in and ultimately to be taken and lose your na nationhood. This is what happened, you know, when the Assyrians came down. They took put, put hooks in them to drag them out of there. A horrible, terrible uh, piece of history. God doesn't want that to happen, but he reminds them, I'm a God. I'm still God. I made the mountains. And I cause the waters to rise into the skies. I keep them up there as long as I want to. And then I let them come down to water the earth. That's, that's your God. That's your God. Why don't you come to me? Seek me and you shall live as a nation. But keep on the way you're going and you're going to die as a nation. Do you get the lesson? I hope we've been able to answer a few questions and, and, uh, and clear up a few points in this. I do want you to continue to read in the book of Amos. Remember, you're going to learn more about God and you're going to become more disgusted with human nature. But you're also going to see the wonderful outstretched invitation of God even to the very last hour. Let's look to God in prayer. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I wonder if I'm talking to someone who has never felt the chastening of the Lord with the loss of joy and peace because you never knew God's joy, God's peace. So you don't know what it is for a Christian to be disciplined. I'd like to invite you. There's an invitation for you to come to Christ. There's an invitation to you to be saved. For Jesus Christ died for you. His blood was shed for you. And you may have the remission of sins. So I want to give you this invitation. It's from God's own word. You come to him. Call upon him. And just as he said to Israel, his ancient people, Seek me and ye shall live. Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be saved. So he's saying to you tonight, Come. Come. Let's pray. Now, Father, there may be believers here tonight who have been worried and concerned because of the chastening of the Lord. 
There may be believers here who have not understood why certain physical things went wrong, or material things, or financial things didn't go the way they wanted them to go. And perhaps they thought they were being punished, but not necessarily so. Help them to understand basically thy form of chastening that is of a spiritual nature that we might return unto thee and have the joy of thy salvation and the fruit of the Spirit restored to us. O Father, we know the tree is good. We know the tree is sound, but the fruit sometimes is spoiled because of ill treatment, because of parasites that get into the fruitage. Father, we want the fruit of the Spirit to be wholesome and pure and clean and wonderful. So deal with us as individuals tonight as thou seest our need and thanks again for the privilege of meditating upon these things. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.